All right. Good morning, Asbury. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Alec, and I'm excited to be here in worship with you all this morning. I want to take just a moment to welcome any first-time guests that are with us this morning and say that we're very excited to have you with us. We would love the opportunity to connect with you, and we have a few ways that we can do that. Option one is you can pull out a connection card that's in the seat back pocket in front of you. Uh, if you want to fill that out during worship and drop it in the offering plate during offertory, that's the best way to do that. Or option two is you can send a text message to 281-305-1069 that says welcome. So text the word welcome to that number uh, and you'll receive a follow-up text with the same uh, with connection to fill out that same quick connection card just online. If you are a first time guest, go ahead and stop by our welcome desk on your way out of worship this morning so we can give you a small gift as a way of saying thanks for being here. Once again, my name is Alec. If you need someone to talk to after worship, I am right back there. Without further ado, let's get ready to worship. Thank you, Alec. Let's go ahead and stand together. Those that are willing, that are able, if you're at home, the words are going to be on the screen um, as they are here in the sanctuary this morning. Let's lift our voices up to God this morning in celebration. This is House of the Lord.
while Miss Kay is making her way up to the podium, if I could have any of the choir camps kids come forward in front of the altar, please. These are a few of the students that went to choir camp. We had nine students. Some of them were in the early service and four adults. Uh, I want to say thank you to all of you for the support you gave to these students financially and the support how you encouraged them to go to choir camp. They could not have done it without your help and we are so grateful. Uh, your altar rail offering, uh, you supported the lemonade stand, a uh, number of small groups uh, gave money so these students could attend the choir camp. And I want you to know it's not just a choir camp where we sing. We do sing, but it is an opportunity for students to learn more about how to worship and to praise the Lord. And they have a lot of fun doing that. Uh, Paula was one of our counselors who went and Monica Bush was the other, and they took really good care of our students while they were at Lakeview. Our theme was Lean on Me, and all of us learned that we can lean on each other as a community, but we always can lean on God. Now I want you to hear from the students about some of the fun things they did. Okay, who would like to go first? You want to go first, Asher? All right, tell us how you experienced God or something that you really enjoyed at choir camp. I experienced God the most at choir camp by meeting new friends and when everybody in the camp sang together. And Brayden, what was your most fun thing or how you felt God at choir camp? Well, this year at choir camp, uh, there was a lot more... I experienced a lot more joy than I have in the past years. Singing, it just made me feel way more welcome and I actually feel way more comfortable singing in a group than I used to. And one of the best things to me about choir camp was probably all the fun we got to have together and just spending time with people like that we know and people we actually don't know. So Brayden and Jackson actually moved up to the middle school camp, so there's a little bit more freedom in that camp versus the elementary camp. So they get, to, I, I saw pictures of a foam party, um, silent disco. Logan, do you want to take one? Okay. Logan spoke this morning, so we're going to pass it over to Lucan. Lucan, can you tell me how you felt God at choir camp or your most fun thing that you did? My most favorite thing was swimming in the lake. We were searching for clams. <laughs> and they were slimy, but the kids absolutely loved it. Okay, Jackson and I spoke a little bit before, and besides the three choir rehearsals each day, um, the middle school and high schoolers were allowed to pick some classes that they were interested in, and he wants to tell us about one of the classes he took. So one of the classes I took was sign language. It was really fun because all the movements were, were about God and the song. It was just really great and graceful. So I was in elementary camp, and I had eight girls and 12 boys, and God definitely appeared in some powerful ways, even through the sweat, some tears, and all of the joy. Um, some examples of that were when there were some joyful interactions between four of our own Asbury boys when they ate a pint of bluebell ice cream in front of me in the hammocks and did not share. And so I told them what God would think about that. There was a, I was, um, the eight elementary girls that I were with each night told how they were grateful to God for something before they went to bed. The kids working together to catch and release crickets that had snuck into our cabins. Definitely God and lots of joy and the silent disco, the lake swimming and making new friends, and the giggles and fun that kids experienced as they got to watch an operatic concert version of Meow. So if you see one of them, ask him about that because it was, there was lots of giggles and lots of fun. 
And then I just wanted to say that um, there was a young camper who, and it's not Lucan, but there was another camper who had an accident on the jumpy pillow where he collided with another camper and the counselor was trying to check him and make sure he was okay and asked another young boy to please move out of the way so that the counselor could check him. And his response was, no, I cannot move. This is my friend and I want him to be okay and pray for him. So there were a couple of tears there from the grown-ups because it was so endearing. But I just want to say how proud I am of these kids for getting up this morning and sharing their testimony with you guys and all the different ways that they saw and felt God. And they were awesome at camp. I, they were well-behaved and had lots of fun. And I'm just really proud of them for sharing this morning. Okay, so any of our kids who are three years old through third grade, if you'd like to go join Miss Paula, uh, they're going to be heading out to Wow Worship, which is like our children's church, and they'll be right down the hall here, and they're welcome to join her. Well, friends, it's so good to see you in worship today, um, especially after our field trip last week where we were worshiping at Parkwood, which was, I think, so, like, there was just such a good spirit in the room, and so for all of you who made that trip with us out there last week, thank you so much, but it's good to be home, and I'm glad to see you in worship today. Why don't you stand and greet one another in the love of Christ for just a second today? All right, everyone, let's get back to our seats. Actually, I have quite a number of uh, prayer requests this morning, so you might even want to grab a pencil and jot some of these down. Uh, Ruth Christian has COVID and is um, struggling with it and asked for prayers. Dennis Humphrey uh, had surgery this week, and um, so asking for prayers for his recovery. Kristen McKee, as she continues to fight brain cancer. Eddie Fincher uh, got to go home from uh, rehab this week, but um, is asking for prayers for his recovery as he continues physical therapy and that kind of thing. Dwight Carroll asked for prayers this morning for his son, um, who is back from the military um, and going through some struggles. Um, we're also asking for prayers for Hilda Gonzalez's father, who had um, a procedure recently and then in the last couple of weeks lost both his brother and his best friend. And so that's a lot to go through all at once. So prayers for Hilda's dad. And also Teresa Berry, um, who we haven't seen in a few weeks, and that's because she's been dealing with a really bad case of shingles and is in a lot of pain and asked for prayers for that too. So let's go ahead and bow our heads and our hearts as we go to God this morning. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you so much for this place, this time, this community of believers, most of all for your Holy Spirit that encourages us, lifts us up, and accomplishes so much through us more than we ever could on our own. For all these and many more we give thanks. Now this morning we lift up our exhaustion to you because a lot of us have been feeling kind of exhausted after everything that's been happening the last couple of weeks. And we're just wanting to be honest and saying that that's part of what we have to offer today. But alongside that, so many of us can point to ways that you have showed up for us. And we don't want to bypass that and forget to thank you for it or to include it in, as part of the testimony of what you do in our lives. So we want to take a moment silently and just remind ourselves and re Lift up to you, Lord, the ways that we have seen you show up in the last week or two. Thank you so much for your provision for us. We want to also take a moment and acknowledge that we have a lot of burdens that we came in the door with today. And that's another thing that we have to offer you today. We have good stuff too, Lord, we promise. But like, we need to be honest, too, about like all these things that are weighing us down, and we're going to take a moment and share those. 
In scripture, you said, Jesus, uh, that we can give our burdens to you and you would give us rest for our souls. So we pray that we would have that experience this week. Today, we ask, Lord, that instead of asking you to come alongside us, that we would be willing to go where you are. <laughs> Even if that means that we have to leave behind something or our comfort zone. But Lord, we want you to be guiding our lives and not the other way around. So, so help us to do that, Lord. Give us the courage to leap with you. Thank you for all the good you're doing in the world. And help us to keep seeing the kingdom of God breaking in to all the regular stuff too. We ask that you would bless the gifts that are about to be received and that it's what you want that would happen with them and not what we want. You are good to us, Lord. You are faithful. We trust you. Help us to trust you more. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. You might have noticed a new blessings box whenever you walked in the door this morning. Um, it is there for folks to be able to grab uh, non-perishable food anytime they need it, or you can place it in there as well. Anyway, we had a kid in our church who did his Eagle Scout project, and he just built that new blessing box and delivered it yesterday, and it's really great. And so if you ever get to see Ben Bordofsky around church, please tell him thank you. He did a good job. It's that kind of ministry that you're a part of whenever you give here at Asbury. So in a moment, uh, when the music really gets going, you can stand if you want and place a gift on one of the offering plates by the back doors here. There's lots of ways to give online. In whatever way you're partnering in ministry with what God's doing here at Asbury, thank you.
once again, just the voices this time. Let's lift it up to the Lord this morning. How great is our God. Amen. Y'all take a seat. You want to see an example of how great our God is? You might remember that in May, I came back from General Conference with a challenge. That I learned that many of our brothers and sisters in the Congo were leading churches, pastors who didn't have a single Bible in the whole church um, and to lead worship with or have Bible study with. And so I kind of issued a challenge and Wow, Asbury, you know, just responded, and we took off, and it grew to other churches in the way that only God can do. It expanded from there into bicycles so that pastors can get to their churches, so that they can drive uh, members to the hospital, drive, ride, whatever. Um, Anyway, so we thought it would take a long time internationally to get all of those resources to them, but the week of the hurricane, it turns out that they were able to distribute all of it. And we are happy to be able to share with you the fruit of that ministry. Take a look. We're also distributing Bibles. Uh, in, some, uh, in some districts, uh, we don't have enough Bibles. So uh, through some of our friends and partners, we are distributing Bibles. We are distributing bicycles for pastors. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, because some of our districts are very large, uh, in total I have about 51 districts all combined. It's pretty cool, and I hope that you'll continue to be praying for them as they carry out their ministry now better equipped to be able to bring the Word of God to people. It's just such a great thing to be a part of. Thank you so much. Let's pray together. God, as we apply ourselves to Scripture this morning, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to us through the words of the Bible today, whatever we need to hear in our hearts. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I think the right question has the power to change your life. Uh, the question, will you marry me, comes to mind as an example. That's a pretty life-changing question. But there are other ones, too, that are smaller and yet still really significant. I remember a time a friend, actually Kip, who you saw on the video, asked me how I felt about something that was going on in my life. And I told him what I thought about it. And he said, no, 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 Lindsay, how does it make you feel? And I said, well, here's what I think. And finally he goes, Lindsay, can you even name three emotions for me? Well, it took me um, a full five minutes. 
And uh, the only emotions I could think of in all that time were happy, sad, and mad. That's all I had in me. And, uh, you know, I kind of did okay in school, and that was the best I could come up with. And it was in that moment that I realized that, like, I had really walled off my emotions so much that I couldn't even think of what they were, much less what of them I was actually experiencing. That question really caused me to do some soul searching. And then we discover along the way that we have a God who asks us questions. I mean, we know that we have a lot of questions for the Lord, but he actually cares enough about us to be interested in us and our answers because he wants us to do some soul searching. Because every time he asks us a question, he's actually trying to help us discover something. And of all the questions that God asks in the Bible, and there are a lot of them, there is one that I think really gets to the heart, not only of Christianity, but also of like life on earth and like what it's all about. So let's, let's read together how Jesus actually called his disciples whenever he started out in his ministry and see what that might mean for our discipleship today. I'm going to go ahead and encourage you to grab a blue Bible from a chair in front of you or pull it up on your device. We'll be reading from the Gospel of John. You might know that in the very back of the Bible is 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Those are good too, but that's not what we're reading today. We're reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, beginning in verse 35. I'm reading from the CEB version, but whatever translation you use is great. The next day, John the Baptist was standing again with two of his disciples, and when he saw Jesus walking along, he said, Look, the Lamb of God! And the two disciples heard what he said, and they followed Jesus. And when Jesus turned and saw them following, he asked, What are you looking for? What are you looking for? And they said, Rabbi, which is translated teacher, where are you staying? He replied, Well, come and see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. And it was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two disciples who heard what John said and followed Jesus was Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated Christ or anointed one. And Andrew led him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas or Peter or Rock. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right. I want to tell you a little bit of my story today. It seems kind of odd to admit it, uh, but the truth is that I loved the church way more and before I loved God for a long time. And that was for a lot of reasons. Um, I was a kid. It's easy to see church. It was easier for me to see church than it was for me to see God. That took a while. I was also an achievement-oriented kind of kid, and I liked doing, like, the things that I was supposed to do, and for the most part, even though I've always had a little bit of a rebellious streak in me. And if church was something that I was supposed to do, I could go, and I could do it, and I could check it off my list and feel good about myself and move on. I'm also pretty extroverted. I love you know, being around lots of people, and church had all the people. I grew up in a church of 4,000 members. We did vacation Bible school. We did music and arts camp. We went on choir tours and choir camp in Lakeview, and I even did this old school thing they used to do called puppet ministry, if you can believe that. I don't know if anybody else remembers that. The church bus picked us up from school every Wednesday afternoon in 15 other elementary schools in our neighborhood and to go to children's choir every week. Back in the days when everybody went to church, there was so much to do, and we did it, and I was good at it, and I loved it. But that didn't mean I knew the Lord. I certainly grew in what I knew about the Lord. I could tell you Bible stories. I knew what God was supposedly like, but I didn't know him. That came for me years later. It was about 10 years later. In fact, I started loving church when I was five. I met Jesus when I was 15. And during that 10 years in between, if somebody were to ask my 8-year-old or 13-year-old self what I was looking for, 
out of Christianity, I would have said something like, I want a way to help people. Because I saw churches helping and doing good things for people. We had a, a clothing ministry and a food pantry at my church. I liked being a part of helping people. And that was a fine beginning. Uh, but it wasn't discipleship. The reality is discipleship, which is a church word for following, and people are disciples today of all kinds of things. Discipleship is alive and well, my friends. There is discipleship of celebrities and Instagram uh, influencers and country musicians and rock bands and Comic-Con and all kinds of things. In fact, social media even kind of like made it official because they call people followers, right? Which is just the English word for disciple. So what following Jesus is all about, it starts with when you meet him. Now, you might feel like you're, the moment that you met someone was whenever you came across them on YouTube. That was like your meeting with them. Or maybe you heard that band on the radio, and that was the moment where you met them. That's your meeting. When it comes to meeting Jesus, it can happen through the pages of the Bible. You can meet God that way. You can meet God in the flash of a moment, like when he reaches out to you somehow through a thought or a conversation or through nature. At some point, God's going to try to get a hold of you. For me, it was at a UM Army mission trip in Bryan, Texas, and I came to this razor edge moment of realizing I had to dive into faith, even though I could think of a hundred reasons why not to. I was living in my doubts, but then you leap. You make a choice to meet Jesus, and after years of loving church and learning a lot about God, I was no longer satisfied with that. Being a good person was good, but it can't be everything, because once we're here on earth, deciding to be good while we're here, that's a great plan. I, like, I highly recommend it, but it can't be the why for our life. If you're talking who, what, when, where, how, why, making your life goal to be a good person is a great how, but it's not really a why. So, I want you to shout out this morning the name of somebody famous. Anybody famous, just shout it out. Hmm? Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan. Okay. Michael Jordan couldn't make it on his high school team one year, but then he grew some more. And then he uh, clearly did well in basketball. He became a phenomenon. But then what really took off was the shoe empire, right? And that made him a billionaire or whatever he is today. Those are things I know about Michael Jordan. I am not going to call Michael Jordan on his personal cell phone and ask him to come over and help me clean out my closets at my house, right? I didn't only want to know about God, give you the laundry list of details I knew about him. I wanted to be on a first name basis, closer than a phone call away to talk about anything. So I prayed that God would become my savior forever and my helper here and now and that I would come to know Jesus for myself and follow him and not just hear about him from other people. And I prayed that prayer when I was 15. And when I prayed to come home to God to get to know Jesus as my savior, I was filled with like, I've never really had another moment like it, but I just felt like I was full of joy, like it was oozing out of me that everyone could see it. And I had this smile on my face that I couldn't take off. And over time, that faded, of course, somewhat. But what grew in its place was this friendship with God. When I started reading scripture, it felt like I was reading God's diary to me. Like everything felt like it was connecting with what I was going through. I felt his peace. I felt his presence. I wonder if you can remember when you met Jesus. For some of you, you might not be able to remember a time when you didn't know Jesus, and that is such a blessing, that's lovely, I hope you're thankful for that, or maybe, maybe you're here this morning, you're not sure you ever have, and that's okay too. I'd love to talk with you about that sometime if you ever want to. So let's, let's say that we have met Jesus. There's this rather inconvenient truth that we are going to come to realize pretty quick when that happens. We have to come to terms with it. And that is that we can only be a disciple of one thing at a time. Okay? We see that from this passage. John the baptizer sees Jesus walking by. This is the day after he baptized him. He turns to two of his own disciples and says, look, the Lamb of God. And John's disciples, who loved their rabbi and had dedicated much of their life to him, heard their own rabbi say, I'm not it. He's it. And they gave up their relationship with John. They said goodbye. They decided they wanted to meet Jesus, and they knew that in order to do that, they had to leave him. 
because you can only follow one thing at a time. They couldn't be disciples of John and Jesus. You can only serve one master. So if you're following an addiction, you're going to find times when your addiction leads you one direction and Jesus leads you another, and you've got to make a choice. And if you're following success, there's going to be times when your success leads you to make this kind of call, and then Jesus, who lifts up the way of self-sacrifice, leads you in another, and you've got to make a choice. And if you're following yourself, and you make yourself the arbiter of truth and the wisest counsel in your own life, which is like a real tail wagging the dog situation, <laughs> guaranteed there's going to be times when you lead yourself one way and God another, and you've got to decide. At some point, you're going to have to decide to leave the other thing you followed, but after you've met Jesus... And you've decided to leave the other stuff behind. There's going to be this moment where Jesus asks you the same question that he asked Andrew and the other disciple. What was it? What are you looking for from God? What are you looking for? And I think that that might be the most important question maybe ever in all of life. What are you wanting from God? And as is only found in the Christian God, testimony, scripture, the first thing Jesus does isn't say, here's the list. If you want to be with me, here's the list of things you got to believe. Here's the things you got to do, right? The litmus test of you're either with me or you're against me or whatever. He doesn't do any of that to start. He just says, hey, what is it that you're looking for? And I hope that you have asked yourself that question or heard God ask you that question. Maybe you did that when you were 5 or 15 or 50, or maybe you never have, and that's okay. But I believe that Jesus still asks the question because it's where discipleship starts. What is it that you're looking for from God? And your answer to that question matters. It really matters. Because the way you answer the question determines how limited or expansive God is in your life. If you know me well, you know that um, dessert is an important part of my life. And it, it's been too long since I had a dessert-oriented sermon illustration, so here we go. I want you to imagine that this pie right here represents everything that is possible in a relationship with God. Scripture tells us that every good and perfect gift comes to us from the Father of heavenly lights. And so this pie represents everything that is possible in the Lord. And if the thing that you're looking for is to feel good about being a good person because you came to church that week, then what you're setting your sights on is about that much, okay? You're saying, here's what I want. I want to feel like a good person. And so guess how much of the pie you're going to get? You're going to get exactly the amount that you planned for. And let's say, no, that's not really it. Instead, what you're looking for is absolution for the ways that you messed up last week. Well, okay, then that, that's probably what you're going to get. Or let's say that the thing that you're looking for is a little spiritual enlightenment to, like, sit alongside other, you know, common sense, world religions, Oprah, self-help, whatever. Uh, then, then that's probably what you're going to get. Or maybe what you're here for is to make your spouse happy so they'll stop nagging you about coming to church. <laughs> or your mama happy or whatever. And if that's what you're here for, then that's, that's what you'll accomplish. That's what you'll get. And my point is, I think, as you can tell, how much of it are you in for? What is it that you're looking for? Because I'll tell you that when I was 15, I, I know what I was looking for. Um, I was looking for a helper. Do you remember the story in Genesis, Adam and Eve? It says that Eve is called Adam's helpmate. Do you all remember that? Um, and it's a verse that got used for centuries as a way of like, excusing unequal status for women. People would look at that word and say, well, that means that the man is the center and the woman's job is to be like the supporting actress, the helper on the side, right? Which would be totally fine as long as you don't read anything else in the Bible. Um, because <laughs> that word in Hebrew, Ezra Konegdo, 
uh, shows up other places in Scripture too. And in fact, in every single other instance in the Bible, the person that is referred to as the helper, as the Ezer Konegdo, is God. Uh, like here in Deuteronomy. <laughs> so if God is the helper, then is the helper the lesser party? No. Anyway, when I started with the Lord, if I had articulated it this way, if Jesus was asking me, what are you looking for? I would have said, God, I really want you to be my helper. I want you to help me along. I want your comfort. You know, I want you to encourage me. Help me get through this mess I'm in. This is what I want from you, God. And, and you know what? God did that for me. He did, because I asked for it. But after some time, I felt like even that wasn't enough. And now what I want from God is I want him to be my convictor, someone who convicts me whenever I need to be checked. And I want a friend, and I want God to lead the way, not just help me on the way. I want someone I can trust completely, someone I'm happy to put my life in their hands. And the farther that I've gone with Jesus, the farther he's gone with me. And the more that I look for, the more that I receive. And maybe one day I'll get closer to the whole pie. I don't know. I'm not there yet. But I want to be. Which requires me to say, God, I'm all in. I want everything. What are you looking for? Everything. Did you notice how the disciples answered Jesus? He said, what are you looking for? They said, where are you staying? <laughs> they answer the question with a question, which is so human, right? But I think what they're really saying is like, where you, we want to go where you are, Jesus, which is actually the perfect answer. Not, God, will you go with me? Which still puts us at the center. Instead, Jesus, where are you? I'm going to leave where I am. I'm going to leave my comfort zone. I'm going to come to where you are. And the word there for staying, where are you staying, Jesus? It has to do with dwelling, abiding. It's not just a momentary thing, but it's a long term, like, I want to abide with you, Jesus. And Jesus responds by saying, all right, come and see. Just come and see. Here at Asbury, we talk about how there are stages to our discipleship pathway with Jesus. We start at the beginning, but God doesn't leave us there. He wants us to continue to grow deeper and deeper with him. And so we have our four practices, worship, grow, serve, and share. But then we also have four stages to each one. You received, hopefully, a little sheet of paper when you came in the door this morning. Go ahead and take a look. We encourage folks to keep this folded in your Bible. Keep it there every six months. Pull it out again. And you'll see that there are four stages to each practice. And what we encourage you to do is circle the one that uh, most uh, resembles where you are right now. And whichever practice you are at the earliest stage in for the next six months, just try to bump down a level. And then after six months, pull it out again and take a look. And whichever uh, practice you're at the earliest stage in, try to grow to the next stage in that practice for the next six months. It's a way for you to say, I'm going to take the next step with God, and here's how I'm going to do it. You'll notice that the first stage, if you can read that tiny print, is the come and see stage. All of these are the invitations that Jesus made of his disciples. He says, come and see. Then he says, follow me. Then he says, be with me. And finally, on the night before he died, he said, remain in me, and I will remain in you, vine and branches stuff. And right here, at the very beginning of the discipleship, Jesus is just saying, come and see. Check it out. No strings attached. Check for yourself how Jesus lives, where he goes, what he does. See if you like the lifestyle of worshiping, of growing, of serving and sharing. And I want you to notice, Jesus did not go to them and beg them and say, pretty, pretty, please, will you please become my disciples? And pulled on their hand, desperate. We have to take some responsibility, some ownership of our own part to play. If you want to walk with the Lord, then move your own two feet, right? Take the steps. Don't wait for him to do it all. So when you're taking a look at that self-assessment sheet, um, we encourage you to, that's how you know what to do next, what next step to take. So for me, what it looked like uh, when I was 15 and in high school, 
I started reading the Bible every single day, and I was cross-referencing verses all over Scripture and trying to figure out what it all meant. I started leading a Bible study for other youth at my church. I went on mission trips. I gave a testimony during worship one time. I led a mission trip of my college friends. While I was there, we were in Mexico, and I was in charge of making dinner one night, and I thought tacos would be the right thing to do. So I lay out all the taco stuff on the table, and the little kids from Mexico who were at dinner with us burst into tears because they didn't recognize my little gringo whatever, and that was a genius move. But anyway, <laughs> I'm making the steps, right? I'm, I'm trying to walk with the Lord, and that's not supposed to be everybody's steps, but they were mine. And, and these days... Our relationship looks more like a couple weeks ago, I had a situation I was really struggling with, and I left it up. I just said, God, what am I supposed to do with this? And he pointed me to the thing I was preaching that week. That's great. And it was when we were talking about switching our prayers from asking, asking, asking to thanking, thanking, thanking. And I was like, okay, got it, Lord. I'm supposed to be thankful for this. And when, when I worked on that and kind of lifted it as a prayer of thanks to God, I just felt like this wholeness, this peace with the Lord for a moment, that things were right between us, right? And so I can talk to God about the big things, and I can talk to God about the little things like you would a friend. But I would never have had that in my life if when Jesus asked me, what are you looking for, if my answer was, I want to go to church so that I can be a good person. Being a good person is way too small, guys. I want to be a part of God's adventure for the world. I want to be a part of his redemption of it. And I believe that Jesus is asking all of us the same question still today. So on the back of that sheet of paper that you have, you have, it's blank. But I just wonder, could you jot down here? Could you write, what I'm looking for from Jesus is, and then fill in the blank. You could do it here, you could do it at home, but take a moment, and the wordsmithing is not the important thing, but just, there is no right or wrong answer, but I do encourage you to limit yourself, write down what's real and not what you wish was real, <laughs> write down the farthest that is honest, and if you're not willing to leave some other things, including yourself, in order to follow Jesus there, then just don't write it down, right, that's fine. But this morning, I encourage you, get a snapshot of where you are with the Lord right now. What I'm looking for from God is, this morning at the early service, someone came up to me afterwards and said, peace. I said, great, let's pray about receiving peace from the Lord. If you're not sure about any of that stuff, then again, I'm happy to talk about that. Afterwards, I'm, um, so are our prayer partners who will be up here after service. I know that if what you're looking for is within God's will, he will meet you in that place of need and provide it. So today I'm, leading, I'm leaving you with this sheet of paper to take home and maybe put in your Bible. I'm leaving you with a poem that I'm about to re read, um, share with you. And I'm leaving you with the question that Jesus asks all of us. What are you looking for from God? And my prayer is that, is that you find your answer. I asked the Lord for money and wondered why I didn't see him in my relationships. I asked the Lord to help them and wondered why I didn't see him show up for me. I asked the Lord for help and wondered why he wasn't leading the way. Until one brave day, I asked God for everything and saw that everything I have he gave and everything he is, he is for me. And so now I ask the Lord for himself. And every day have more than I need. Let's pray together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You could have just said, here it is. Here's what's available to you. Take it or leave it. Instead, you ask us, because it's a relationship, and you're, you're open to whatever we're open to, and so our prayer this morning, Lord, is that 
you would keep this question kind of nagging at us like a woodpecker on a tree until we come to an answer. And we pray, Lord, that that answer would be within your will and that you would fulfill it and then maybe just even a little bit more. And God, if we have never met you before and we want to, then help us to take a leap of faith and say, in spite of everything, in spite of all of my doubts, I decide, I choose to believe that Jesus Christ is my Savior, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is my God, my Master. I'm going to put my life in your hands, and I'm going to entrust you for this life and the next. I'm willing to live the way you want me to live. I'm willing to do what you want me to do, Lord. My life is not my own. It is yours. And God, for for the reality that, that many of us have said that before and have you as our Lord, we just give you thanks for our salvation today. But God, if we have had a hard time leaving something else behind in order to pursue you, help us. And one day, Lord, get us to the place where we're able to pray, God, give me everything. I'm willing to go forward for you. I'm willing to step back for you, to be laid aside for you. I'm willing to have everything. I'm willing to have nothing. Everything I am and have is at your disposal, God. I want it all. We want it all, Lord. Help us to want it all. <laughs> we trust you. We love you. We thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. If you're willing and able, stand with us as we sing one more time together. This is called Go Anywhere. Let's stand as you're willing and able to sing. Thank y'all. All right, guys, a few things I want to let you know about. Um, fill the bus. We've got one more week to be able to grab these school supplies. They're a little worried that because of the hurricane and everything that, that this might get off of people's radars, and it might, and a lot of us have a lot going on right now, so if you can't, that's fine, but if you have the chance to grab some of these things, there is a big old like cardboard school bus over here, and you can put that stuff in there next Sunday. Um, also, we're having a family night at the LaPorte Wave Pool this Tuesday night, 7.30 to 9.30. Asbury folks only, we're taking it over. We're going to have some pizza. And so if you have kids at the house, we would love to have you uh, join us. It's going to be a lot of fun. Also, this Friday night is a parents' night out. If you have potty trained three-year-olds through fifth graders, um, then you don't need to be convinced of how great this is. You already know. Uh, but you do need to register to make sure we have enough safe sanctuary supervision going on. So let um, Paula or Jalen know kids at asbury.cc. Um, also, Sylvia Rooney is one of our high schoolers. She's leading a Bible study uh, right now. And it's on Tuesdays at 6.30 at her house. And whether you can just come once or all four times or whatever, uh, they would love to have you. So um, if you're a high school student, this would be a great opportunity. 
We also have a group called Accompanied. It's for folks in their 20s, which is kind of a hard time in the church. It's like you're trying to figure out where you belong and where you fit in. So this is a group uh, for those folks, first and third Wednesdays, Mama Mia's at 630. And uh, Jesse and Hallie over here could tell you all about it. They would love to have you. Um, also, we actually this morning ran out of... Um, slots, time slots for our photo directory. Um, and so be checking your church newsletter, the church happenings this Wednesday, uh, because we're hoping to be able to open up a third day and we'll, we'll put those slots available, but go ahead and grab them before they too run out. Um, and we have prayer partners and they'll be up here. I'm happy to pray for you as service closes. I hope your week ahead is fantastic. I hope that if the Lord says, hey, come and see, that you're willing to go and check it out. But remember that God goes before you to show you the way, behind you to keep you moving, above you to watch over you, beside you to befriend you, and within you always to give you peace. Amen. Yeah.